This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We're blessed with great mountains, beautiful sweeping beaches, and wild rivers. Over 180,000 kilometres of them. As a mountainous island chain in a boisterous corner of the world's largest ocean, our rainfall can be massive, making our rivers turbulent and unpredictable. I'm Craig Potton, and I've been photographing New Zealand landscapes just like these for 40 years. I just love it. It's my passion. Make an art out of the mountains, out of the forests, out of the coastline, and out of our rivers. For me, they are the arteries that connect everything together. I'm going to travel some great New Zealand rivers, each one with its own story. Wow, that's right. I'll meet people who care for rivers and the creatures which live in and around them. Hey, what a beautiful new is. I'll journey between source and sea and try to understand how rivers have shaped the land and influenced our culture. But above all, I want to see if we can use our rivers wisely and protect their wildness for our children. There are four great glacier-fed rivers that pour off the Southern Alps, forming the Canterbury Plains. I've chosen to journey up the Rangitata, one of New Zealand's finest braided rivers. Between the Southern Alps and the Canterbury Plains lies a fabled land known to New Zealanders as the High Country, a place of open skies and wind-driven tussocks. Snaking its way through the stunning landscape is the Rangitata River, with its intertwining braids like plaited hair, running from the mouth to its source in the Southern Alps. Thirty years ago, my mate and climbing companion Robbie Burton and I spent three months traversing the Southern Alps. We tried to climb to the source of this river, the fabled Garden of Eden Ice Plateau, but we never made it. Three decades later, and we're going to give it another bash. So that's where I'm headed, upstream against the flow, from the intensive farms of the Canterbury Plains, through a wonderful pocket of Potocarp Forest, into the fabled high country, and to the source of this great river high in the ice mountains. My journey starts here at the mouth of the river, halfway down the east coast of the South Island. There's something subtle and beautiful about the greys of the gravel against the grey churn where the river meets the ocean. It's here that the water cycle begins. The Great Pacific Ocean is just a holding tank for the Rangitata. It's going to lift up the water, carry it through the clouds and take it right back to the mountains, drop it there and the Rangitata cycle just continues. But the Rangitata is under threat. Here, in the lower reaches, the river has been severely compromised by people's actions. A little way across on the river there, people everywhere. Eugenie Sage is a long-time crusader against the misuse of river resources, and at the mouth of the Rangitata, she's got plenty to concern her. You often hear that 90% of the water in Canterbury goes out to the sea, as if it's wasted it's in doing thing. that, mm. uh, rather than it's, it's the whole basis of the system and mm. all of this web of life. All around the Rangitata, water is taken from the river and underground sources to irrigate farmland. This reduces the flow. Less flow means less native fish and plant life and no barrier to the daring effluent running into the Rangitata. The river has become over-energised with fertiliser and effluent and polluted with poisons like nitrates and cadmium. And the best way to get an overview of what's happening with the river is from the air. Rivers are the lifeblood of Canterbury's farming industry. Since 2002, the amount of irrigated land in the province has almost doubled, from 2,800 square kilometres to over 5,000. From the chopper, it's clear that the river's winding gravel braids are gradually becoming enclosed by dairy farmland. Well, what we're seeing here is the development of pasture right up to the margin of the river and giving no buffering. There's a huge amount of science which shows the value of having a strip along the river of vegetation so that any of the runoff gets a chance to be filtered before it gets into the river. But here, the 
price of um, dairy land is so high, it's so valuable, that the river is being confined to a much narrower corridor uh, because of the development on either side. The whole of that area on the south bank would have once uh, been a major part of the, the river bed and it's been progressively developed and now in the last 10-15 years converted from dryland farming to very intensive dairy. And what the effect of that will be on groundwater and on coastal systems is still to be fully understood. It's not likely to be positive, is it? No. Adding to the pressure on the river is the 67-kilometre Rangitata Diversion Race, New Zealand's largest irrigation scheme. Taking up to one-third of the river's flow, it's used for hydroelectric power and the irrigation of 660 square kilometres of farmland. But it feels like, as a resource, the Rangitata is suffering. On the plains, we've lost virtually all of our indigenous plants. Uh, so the rivers are the only wild areas, and yet we're not treating them with the respect that they deserve. Here we've got broom, gorse, uh, vehicles up and down the bed, and then this uh, encroachment. Yeah, and then right beside us, something that's quite extraordinary, really. I mean, it looks like some apocalyptic scene almost, doesn't it? It is. Somebody obviously trying to protect their uh, crop field here by dumping old telegraph poles and trying to protect it against the, the next flood. That pile of concrete there would never be just dumped into native forest that was protected. I mean, why do you think that is? Why aren't we loving our rivers? We take them for granted. If you're logging a native forest, you can see the bulldozers, you can see the cleared forest. Here, with the nitrates leaching down through the soils into the groundwater, into, um, then into spring-fed streams, like Ealing Stream, further mm. up the Rangitata, and then going offshore. It's hundreds of tonnes of nitrate each year, and we don't know the effects of those. Nearly 70% of all New Zealand's irrigated land is in Canterbury. And it seems to me that the growth of the dairy industry has been at the expense of the river. Like you, Janie, I can't help but feel angry about how our rivers are being treated here. And it isn't just the river that's under threat. I travel further upstream through the river braids and flat farmland to where the hills begin to rise. And I find the beautiful native podocarp trees of Peel Forest which stand as testimony to what this area used to look like. This is a beautiful forest, an extraordinary piece of lowland podocarp forest, of native forests in New Zealand. And yet, this is the only piece that is left between here and Christchurch. I think that this sort of forest, it's a treasure, it's a repository, it's a bank that's left for us that we can use in the future and hopefully extend out into the land again. One person who is trying to make that happen is Rosemary Ackland. This forest has been gifted to the nation by the Acklands and Rosemary is chairperson of the Rangitata Gorge Landcare Group who are guardians of this river. Wow, look at this tree. <laughs> it's wonderful, isn't it? Any guesses how, how old it might be? Well, I think it's about, it's been said that it's about a thousand years old. Right. And I like to think of the mower reclining under here, just resting. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. With an eagle mm. maybe sitting up higher <laughs> on it. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so this actual tree could have been here longer than any human has been in New Zealand, and it's still here. That's what's so wonderful, that it is still here. Absolutely. And thank goodness for the people who had the vision to just save particularly this but a bush. One of your family, the Acklands, actually did have a, have a part in protecting this place. A, a brother-in-law of right. J.B. Ackland came mm -hmm. out to New Zealand and yeah. wanted to protect a little bit. And in 1881, he bought this particular piece of bush called the Mills mm -hmm. Bush, mm -hmm. and it's never been milled. It's the only bit of bush wow. he, uh, out of this mixed pot of cart bush that hasn't been milled. What is it about the river that really... I think there are a lot of things, really. There's the... First of all, it's just a spiritual value uh, mm. of the river, where people just go to be quiet and enjoy mm. it, and, and it's the changing river too. You know, the times when it's northwest wind and mm. raining up on the mountains and the rivers are roaring tirade, mm. washing bridges out and doing all that damage. Then I think when it comes down and there are the little birds on the edge of the river, the wading birds that need protecting, and if we let the whole thing go to broom, they wouldn't have a nesting mm. place. And then I think there's the recreational thing, and I just love to see the rafts going down the river and coming in with people smiling faces, having enjoyed a day on the river. John Barton Ackland was one of the first European settlers to arrive in the high country in 1855. 
the Acklands became part of the landed gentry here. Their family church is one of Canterbury's oldest, with its own strong link to the river. So, I mean, there's something quite wonderful about the fact that we've talked about the spiritual value of the river and the water and what it means to us. And then we come to the House of the Spirit and it's built from the rocks of the river. And I think there's something very poetic and very lovely about that. Yeah, when I think about these boulders being dragged up from the river and heated and tapped to make them break where the natural fault was, mm. and then pieced together bit by bit, I think it's all quite biblical, really. Rosemary and her fellow locals are truly inspiring in their zeal for keeping the Rangitata environment pristine. She's genuinely passionate about leaving this place in good shape for future generations. The biggest battle that Rosemary and her landcare group are facing is broom, a dreaded river weed which creates problems for both nesting birds and for river flow. There's an extensive weeding program in place. Rosemary takes me upstream to show me this amazing vista, free from all the broom that has so affected the local flora and fauna, and all down to the landcare group's hard work. It was starting to take over, and we realised what a precious thing the river is, mm. not only for us, but for the whole of New Zealand. And so we started to look at ways of when we can, how we could all pull together mm -hmm. to protect it or to control the broom and other weeds. It's so inspiring to see the river flowing freely and in such good hands. Well, I mean, you are winning, aren't you? Oh, you're definitely winning. Yeah. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> um, no, and it is, it's exciting to be part of a plan like that. It's been exciting to be part of a team that's all pulling together mm. and going in, uh, in the same direction. I think that's really exciting. Coming up, I battle the famous Canterbury Norwester. This wind can almost drive you a bit crazy out here. One of the ever-present features of the Rangitata River is the strong nor'wester wind that blows down from the mountains. Oh. Ah. Jumping down out of the nor'wester, this wind can almost drive you a bit crazy out here. Almost like a, an annoying personality at times. It just thunders down the valley and it sort of beats at your park ahead and it sort of gets dust in your eye if you turn into it and it sort of rattles away at you. But um, I guess I have to say, I, in a funny sort of way, I kind of like it. It's a part of the wildness, a part of something that's much bigger than me, some bigger presence in the valley, this wind just blowing down. I've come to accept the Norwester as, as, as a great personality of the valley. I've made my way upstream towards the foot of Cloudy Peak Range where we can see the river's gravel braids. These are the post-glacial gravels that are part and parcel of the South Island's braided river systems. It's only in Alaska, Iceland, the Andes and parts of the Himalayas that similar braided channels occur. In amongst the windswept tussocks of the braids, I meet Colin O'Donnell from the Department of Conservation. He's an expert on one local inhabitant here, the Rybill, the only bird in the world with a sideways curved beak. This beak that we hear about is, is extraordinary because it's curved. Yeah, it's curved, curved to the right. It's the only bird in the world that has a beak that's sort of curved to one side. So. The only bird? The only there bird, No yeah. other species yeah. beak, a curved Hasn't beak. been discovered. Isn't that amazing? It is so, amazing. So it's an adaptation for getting under rocks? Yeah, I think the flattened stones, like the You'll see the shingle out here is very flattened, and so the beak can sweep and feel underneath these flattened stones and feel ah. the mayflies. Okay. We've arrived on the Rangitata at the wrong time of the year to see any rivals. Unfortunately, the closest I'm going to get is this archive footage. 
This wading bird winters in large tidal harbours up north before returning here to mate and lay its eggs amongst the stony riverbeds. Its distinctive curved beak is the ideal tool for foraging under river stones. How are they surviving? Are their numbers increasing or, or decreasing? Uh, we think their numbers are decreasing um, slowly. Mm. Uh, there's probably between four and 5,000 rival left in the whole world and uh, they're spread over about 20 rivers, but oh. most of them uh, nest either here on the Rangitata River or on the Rakaia River. They've got quite a few threats. Uh, one of the biggest threats are introduced predators, so things like your wild cats, stoats, yep. rats, ferrets and so on. They'll take the eggs, they'll feed on the chicks. Yep. These bears need the bare open spaces, the bare shingle to nest on. They don't nest in trees or bushes. Yeah. They're on the yeah. ground yeah. and they like to have a good view around them. I really admire the way these tough little birds have adapted to their wild river home. We're here in late autumn, so they've already gone to their winter feeding grounds. The rivals all go to, um, dare I say, Auckland, but places like the Manukau Harbour, the Firth of Thames, uh, they're sort of holiday winter wow. destinations. And there's plenty of food up there on the estuaries for them. They gather in huge flocks. And then uh, in about August, they'll fly back down here to the South Island. The rival is designated as a threatened species, and with the Rangatata being its principal home, the work Colin is doing to clear predators and weeds couldn't be more important. My hope is that we'll start applying management and protection to them. That way you will start to see reverses in their numbers, and uh, I think that is quite achievable in the longer term. The rival has adapted to the gravel terrain of the Rangatata in its own unique way. But there would be no gravel here if the gigantic glaciers of the Ice Age hadn't pushed through this area, creating the rocks among which they live. This is a, a perfect place to show how the Rangatata River has evolved over the last 20,000 years. Way back then, which isn't so long ago geologically, the river didn't just flow down the valley, it flows down now. It was a sheet of ice, a huge sheet of ice, way above our heads now. It poured down this landscape. You can see that because it bulldozed gravel off the Southern Alps, ripped these lines down the hill on the other side, deposited them out that way, formed the Canterbury Plains. They wouldn't be there without this river. These are very, very important ecological areas that just would never have been there if it had not been for the driving force of the Rangatata River. This glacial surge created a unique wetland landscape too. Just on the other side of the braids, still in the shadow of the Southern Alps, I meet conservation officer Kennedy Lang, who shows me the amazing Ashburton Lakes. These are some of the most pristine wetlands in New Zealand, so Forest and Bird have proposed this area for world heritage status. Is this what we'd call a kettle lake? Yeah, a kettle lake or a kettle hog tarn. And what's happened here is when, when the glaciers were here, as they receded, they left you know, huge blocks of ice, which, as they melted away within the moraine debris, left these big depressions. And over the years, the depressions filled up with silts and built a soil, which changed the drainage. So you get water inundates these lakes over winter. And so we'd be, we'd be standing up to our knees in water at the moment, you know, mid to late winter. OK. And that inundation and annual fluctuation in the water has driven the evolution of a whole suite of species that actually depend on this habitat. What sort of habitat is this here with these little white flowers? We refer to this type of habitat as an ephemeral turf. So ephemeral meaning it comes and it goes over time. And as these surfaces dry out in the spring, you know, they start off as a relatively blank mud surface. And these plants here, you could grow up through that surface or they spread out across it from either seeds or from remaining parts of plants that are there from last season. At a guess, I'd say you're probably looking at 15 to 20 species just within this Just in this area, area here? Yeah, yeah. And the thing about these are all um, turf-dependent species. They only occur on this type of surface. And this, I mean, this landscape just comes and goes. So that's an extraordinary adaptation to be able to handle very dry, 
totally soaked in water, some seasons different than others, some years different than others, and I guess it freezes up here sometimes. Yeah, yeah it completely freezes solid over winter, be un under probably, you know, a foot of foot thick of ice. So yeah, they've made some pretty extreme sort of ad adaptations to this, this type of habitat. Kennedy's work is hugely important. Wetlands used to cover much of New Zealand, but since European settlement, 90% of them have been drained. How do you protect then something as subtle, as changing, as ephemeral, to use your word, as this? I guess the key thing is, is main, maintaining the whole habitat, trying to preserve the hydrology by um, improving the surrounding vegetation. I'm amazed at what can be found once you take the time to get down into the detail of this unique place. Up next, I get up close and personal with one of my favourite wetland plants. This is fine, this is fine. At the Ashburton Lakes, we find the famous Carrix sector, known by kids around here as Dr. Zeus plants. And what are these magnificent these, plants here? These Almost are, like beasts. Yeah, yeah, they're cool. Right? They're, they're Carrick sectors, and um, there's a whole range of wetland Carrick species, but this, this is Carrick sector. Some of these are probably a couple of hundred years old. Uh, they, they just keep turning over new material, so and understand with all of that new material that's turning over all the time, that's produced from nutrients that you're absorbing from the water and the surrounding land. So how do wetlands like this relate to a river system? The key role wetlands have got to play in relation to rivers is that they, they clean the water before it gets into the rivers in many cases. And so all, all your runoff sediment and nutrients that are coming off the surrounding land get processed by plants like Carrick Sector. The nutrients are turned into plant material. They clean the water before it goes into the river, so it maintains good water quality downstream. What's most reassuring about this place is that Kennedy is really upbeat about its future. You've still got really good wetlands. They haven't been drained, and the surfaces haven't been ploughed up to the edge. And so we're really lucky that the functioning of this place, as far as preserving water quality um, and helping reduce the amount of nutrients that go into these rivers, it's still working, you know, and it's, mm. that's due to the really good stewardship of the, of the landowners that have used this place for the last 150 years. I'm so inspired by what Kennedy's shown me that I have the impulse to get my camera out and take a photograph. Sometimes that gets me into awkward situations. Oh, yeah. yeah no, this, is, this is fine, this is fine. <laughs> it might be far enough. I just can go a little bit further. We're going down through several eons of mud, some sort of post-glacial deposit here. Could be. Perfect. Should be. Aha. Which one there, Craig? Yeah, oh, done. Done. I'm, yeah. I'm out of I'm, I'm, I'm not, out of here. I'm not coming out there. You're not coming out there. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? Um, can't get these trousers wet. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, yeah. over, I'm rushing it out here. Here we go, here we go. Grab it lower, grab it lower. Oh, that's excellent. And there? <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. The Rangatata is very significant for local Māori. I meet Dave Higgins of Naitahu who tells me the legend of how this area was first created. Rakai Hotu arrived at the boulder bank at Whakatū in Nelson uh, and uh, immediately discharged his cargo and, uh, and his crew. He sent his son, Rukohoia, down the Kaikoura coast and uh, whilst his son traversed the, the coastline, uh, Rakai Hotu travelled inland. And whilst he was travelling, he created this landscape that we stand on today. Rakai Hotu had an old Polynesian digging stick or ads called Tufaka Kuroria. He got to places uh, in the high country and shaped the valleys that produced the waterway we now call Rakitata. So I'm calling it Rangatata because people call it Rangatata. We're pronouncing it wrongly. 
Uh, no, you're not. Uh, there are, there's a, uh, an obvious southern dialectical difference. Uh, uh, north of uh, about Banks Peninsula, we refer to that river as the Rangitata, mm. and south of the uh, peninsula, it's Rakitata. We use the, the K more readily than the, the NG. How important has it been to iwi from the beginning? What's been the significance of the river for you from use values, perhaps? Hugely important as a, a source of mahikakai. Uh, mahikakai to us, to our people, traditionally, are the, the resources you require to sustain yourself. Not just food, mm. uh, all of the resources, whether they be flax materials to uh, clothe yourself, uh, or kai itself, mm. as you've described. Mm. Uh, the Rakatata was one of those rivers that had, at the headwaters, uh, a pass uh, that was used readily by uh, my ancestors, our ancestors, to traverse uh, Ka Tiritiri or Te Moana, the, um, the Southern Alps, mm -hmm. uh, and to journey over into Te Tai or Potini or the West Coast to gather the, the treasured Ponamu or Greenstone. They still hold a, a reverence to me, mm. and to me they are, and to my family, they still have a, a certain tapu about them. How would you like to see your grandchildren find our waters in New Zealand? We would like, obviously, uh, for all generations, uh, future generations, whether they be Māori or Pākehā, to uh, be able to stand on a riverbank such as this and look into the water and actually see the bottom. There's nothing quite like a day on the river and nowhere better to slow down. Sometimes at the end of a day like this, a whole day on the river, you can come to a point of just quiet contemplation. I think running water does that to you. Things just quieten down and I think you quieten down a little bit too with it. It's a river day. It's a day I just wouldn't swap for anything else. After the break, I head up river to Middle Earth. I'm moving up through the Ashburton Lakes District to a big sheep and cattle station on the shores of Lake Heron. Philip Todd Hunter is the fourth generation of his family to work the high country. He takes the environmental stewardship of his land very seriously. It can be a very costly business in a country overrun with pests and weeds, so it's no small undertaking. He shows me the traps he has in place to catch ferrets and stoats, which are having a big impact on the native bird population. So that trap round here is there? Yes, tra trap just here. Oh, okay. Let's have a look. So these are a Dock 250. Uh, a Dock 250, that's a special model, is it? A special model, so yep. lent to us by our local Geraldine office. Okay. And unfortunately nothing in here this time. Yep. But uh, the ferret comes in front, yep. across, yep. and... Hell. <laughs> <laughs> One dead ferret. One dead ferret. So a hard day at the office for you actually is out on the farm working, and then you come home Instead of putting your feet up and having a beer, you go and walk a long trap um, line. I mean, why do you do it? Oh, the sense of satisfaction of, uh, I really enjoy the birds. It's being out there and the, the high country light, every time is different and, and seeing the birds out there is just... So you're kind of saving species and also helping your soul at the same time, maybe? Very much so, yeah. When I started my journey at the mouth, I was disappointed at how much of the river and its surrounding area was being abused. As I've come further upstream, the stewardship of the land has become more and more reassuring. To prove the point, Philip shows me how he's eradicating the lake willows and bringing back native vegetation. So in your ideal dream for the future, there'd be any willows or would you just sort of eradicate the willows around the edge? Ideally, we'd have all the willows gone and we'd replace them with native shrub and vegetation that would provide some shelter for us. Okay. And, and habitat for the birds. And, and habitat for the birds. Right. And, but that, that's a, you know, 50, 100 year project. A lot of things in conservation are long term, aren't they? They are. You've got to have the dream to want to do it. 
What Philip and his family are doing is really impressive. People who know and love this land, investing in keeping it weed and pest free. In years to come, the birds will flock back here due to the Todd Hunter's good work. It's great to see this generation putting something back into the lake and the river and getting something out of that for themselves. We just had a wonderful afternoon at Lake Heron and around your property, and you're doing some absolutely marvellous things to look after it. But I mean, they come at a cost. I mean, you're trapping stoats, you know, you're cutting down willows. There's no gain in that. Why are you doing this? Well, I had this discussion with Philip the other day. He said to me, some things we do to make a profit, and some things we do because they give us a tremendous amount of pleasure and long-term enjoyment. I suppose just living in amongst all this richness, the beauty, the fact that we can come out here, we might be mustering some sheep, but you can also look out on the riverbed and see the black-fronted terns ducking and diving and, um, you know, the banded doctorals on the shingle riverbeds and just, you know, there's the whole richness of, the, of, of life here. It was all very different, however, for the most famous European to arrive on this river. Samuel Butler was an English author and would-be farmer. He named his sheep station Mesopotamia after the ancient Middle Eastern land whose name meant between rivers. Butler farmed here for just under four years, long enough to make a profit, but his greatest achievement was his satirical novel Erewhon, or Nowhere Backwards. Erewhon's utopian setting was based on Butler's New Zealand experiences, and its name has been immortalised in nearby Erewhon Station. Through Butler's writing and his sketches, his love-hate relationship with the landscape shines through. He complains of ye horrible glaciers, and ye vexatious gullies which are painful in traversing. Yet he also writes, ironically, I am forgetting myself in admiring a mountain which is of no use to sheep. This is wrong. A mountain here is only beautiful if it has good grass on it. Yeah, I love Butler for that forgetting himself phrase. It's what he did when he took time out from farming and he explored the upper valley just out of an exuberance of curiosity, just a desire to go and see what was beyond nowhere. Butler wasn't the only one to be inspired by this valley. Peter Jackson knew where nowhere was and could recognise a wonderful landscape when he saw one. You can see why he chose Mount Sunday for his vision of Edoras. I shot a lot of the stills for the backgrounds of Lord of the Rings, his epic that showcased this land to the world. The trilogy has created a global following with people coming from far and wide to visit what they see as Middle Earth. Hello. Hello. Where are you from? France. France. Yeah. And what are you doing on, on the hill here? Oh, there is a big spot of Lord of the Ring. Yeah. Ah, and so. you're a big fan? Yeah, you? me, big fan. How many times have you seen the movie? I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> And how you like the site? It, it reminds you of Edoras? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, very. Yeah, yeah. Just to imagine the, the building with the castle, and yeah, yeah. you are in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> You're in yeah. the movie. Yeah. Wonderful. I think what Jackson did in Lord of the Rings was amazing, but this landscape has been inspiring greatness for generations. When you think about Butler and Jackson responding to this valley, there must be something in the valley that brings out that imaginative response, that creates the mythologies that, that these artists made out of this place. And I'm sure many more will in the future. Coming up, I try to make it up to the Garden of Eden ice plateau with my old climbing buddies, 30 years after my first attempt. But will the weather let us through this time? Over the years, I've climbed a lot of the big mountains in the South Island, many with my mate, Robbie Burton. And today we're joined by Rangatata veteran, Jeff Spearpoint. 
30 years ago, bad weather thwarted our attempt to get to the Garden of Eden ice plateau. There's something mythical about the Garden of Eden. It hints at a world of purity before things start to go wrong. We have to give it another go. It was a bit grim for us last time, if I remember, coming up here. It was very grim. It was pouring with rain on the divide. Um, <laughs> the rivers were high, yeah. and uh, we were very, very hungry. We'd run out of food. Ah, that I remember. Yeah, and um, I, I clearly remember walking up this, this part of the, uh, the riverbed hoping that we'd find a hut with some food. Today, we have to do one of my least favourite aspects of any wild river tramp, the river crossing. I've done plenty of these in the past, and they are never pleasant. If I'm honest about it, I'm a bit of a wuss when it comes to water and rivers. I, I, I mean, I love them, but I can lie in bed in the bunk at night and actually be scared about I, what's going to happen next I day. I have huge respect for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then most, you know, next to mountaineering, if you're yeah. not doing that, yeah. I think they're clearly the most scary thing to happen. You know, yeah. They're really unpredictable. And yeah. You really underestimate them at your peril, I think. I think some of the hairiest we've done in midwinters, you know, when yeah. they're just freezing cold. Yeah. And it just hurts <laughs> when you step in, and the further up you get, the more yeah. it hurts. And then when you get out... Downstream of a glacial lake yeah. or whatever. Oh, <laughs> remember in the Godly that time? Yeah, six in the morning. That yeah, was we horror. Up to our chests, and, <laughs> yeah, and we were yeah. kind of dancing in pain on the other side. <laughs> it was so cold. That's right, we started dancing. Down there a few times. There's nothing quite like the feeling of bracing yourself against the flow of a river, knowing that one slip could take you under. I'm the tallest, so I break the current. Robbie pushes against me and Jeff against Robbie, and we work our way slowly across. With wet stones underneath and a flow that takes no prisoners, I slip, I'm close to going under. We're across. We made it. It's been 30 years since I crossed the Rangitata, and it hasn't got any easier. From here, it's a hard two-day trek to the ice plateau, but this time, we're hoping to get as close as we can by helicopter. It's certainly a more comfortable, if not noisier and less fulfilling way to get to the garden than it was walking in 30 years ago. As always, we need the weather on our side, and according to our pilot, Alex, it isn't looking good. We actually want the cloud to go down, because when it goes down, we can, yeah, normally you go through it and then it'll be blue sky on the other side. Right. And if we're lucky, we're going to get to the head of this valley, and we're going to punch through this cloud and lift up above it all. I kind of like it recorded for posterity, and Alex exactly. is going to get through it. How many years have we tried this? And, uh, you know, you get a morning, you really want it to be perfect on it. Yeah, yeah. The forecast has got a big high coming over the country and it clags in and your kind of expectations are going up and down. Yeah, yeah. Off we go. But yeah. It's mountaineering at that. It is. <laughs> Doesn't change in 30 years. You can't have to control the weather. No. But unfortunately, the weather's closing in. We decide to do what all good mountaineers do in this situation, wait. So we've come down the valley a little bit, we're going to sit down here, and that's what we're doing right now, and just wait, and we're going to hope. It's a sort of mountaineers game, waiting and hoping. There is a glimmer of hope straight above us, and that's why we've stopped here, which is a bit of blue sky. I feel that as I've come this far up the Rangitata, I need some sense of closure to my journey. I need to find somewhere that gives me a sense of a beginning to this great river. We spot an extraordinary landscape at the head of the valley. The cloud may have beaten us in our attempt to get to the garden, but this astonishing glacier is as good a place as any to touch a source of the Rangitata. This is a, one of the genuine sort of sources of the Rangitata. 
going out of this old glacier here. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing place. It's yeah. a fantastic little corner of the Southern Alps. Yeah, it is actually it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And it's miles from nowhere. And it's the segment of the blue ice poking out the reef of moraine. You know. Alex, if we could get down there, we'd be really good. If only it had been as easy to get to this point 30 years ago. Oh, this is, this, right. <laughs> that is beautiful. Fantastic. Isn't it? Yeah. It's sublime up here. We are only 80 kilometres from the Pacific Ocean, and yet we are worlds apart. It's like being back in the Ice Ages. It's quite mesmeric, isn't it? This uh, going around and around. It must be um, draining out of here. Yeah, yeah. That's the, whirl, the slight whirlpool must be the, the actual water draining yeah. um, back down into the river. This is the beginning of the river, locked up in the ever so slow grinding movement of frozen water. As each of these bits of ice thaws, the water begins to flow. The river has just got purer and purer from the mouth as I've journeyed upstream. And what a place to say goodbye to this stunning waterway. This actually is where the water first starts flowing from the glacier, the water flowing as the Rangitata. And it's beautiful, it's stunningly beautiful. It's a little mini Antarctica landscape, really. It's a gem. And I'm feeling pretty happy about arriving at this tranquil, beautiful, quiet, pristine beginning of the Rangitata River. From a grim beginning, where it seemed this mighty river was being abused, I've been greatly encouraged by my journey. Thanks to the efforts of some fine people who hold the values of the river deer, the Rangitata is in good heart further upstream. I've reached its purest, most untouched part, and even though I didn't make it to the Garden of Eden, I got close, and I found a little piece of paradise. <laughs> 